the Drupal 8 batch engine is the tool used. Anytime you see that little progress bar going across where you're doing, you know, you're running an install or you're doing a bulk update, uh, and the you know, Drupal kind of stops and it's like, it gives you accounts and a progress bar that runs all the way across the screen and maybe the message updates. That's the batch prop system. Okay. Uh, and you can tap into that uh, and write your own batches, modules that generate your own batches. And you need to do a long, slow running job, particularly imports, uh, mass deletes, things like that. Uh, and particularly when you're running an environment like Pantheon, uh, where you can't, uh, where, you, where you have to play by the time limits, where you can't just run forever. Uh, but, but you need a job that may take several more than the, time, the normal PHP timeout, where you need that. Uh, and it handles lots of this kind of magic under the hood, uh, or re-bootstrapping so that you don't violate the time limits and it helps you for jobs. Okay. That's what it's there for. Um, if you go out and read just about any advice out there right now on Drupal 8 batches, they will basically say, go do it like you did in Drupal 7, which is only useful if A, you used to do it in Drupal 7, and B, when we, all tra when we transitioned from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, Drupal 8 provided huge number of new uh, features and functions that are packaged up in particular ways to work well with the Symphony core, which is what Drupal 8 built on top of. Uh, and, and so what I've kind of jokingly referred to is if you do it exactly like you did in Drupal 7, it's, it works just fine. You can indeed do that, but you're missing, it's the hardest way possible because you're missing access to all of these great tools that we have, all of these things that make it easy to uh, do the translation, to uh, inject new services, to interact with remote services, database engine, anything that's a service in Drupal 8, it's hard to get to. It's not impossible, but it's it's not the way Drupal 8 is designed to play. And so whatever you do, if you do it the old way, you're kind of a, a round peg in a square hole. Uh, and I had to come up with some excuse to use this picture of a hand-powered ferry. So that's how I got in here. Uh, the guy, you can barely see him on the, the edge of the picture there behind the post, but he is actually hand cranking that ferry across the river. Uh, and that was the lightest I saw that ferry. Most of it, like, he would do it put it down with about four cars. Uh, that man needs a workout. Oh, no, okay. Nice. And his day to day job. Uh, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Hold up the videos here. Uh, so again, the batch system is designed for doing those long-running jobs. Uh, it runs it through the browser, so it's using the browser to read bootstrap Drupal via JavaScript over and over and over again, as long as it needs. Uh, if you, once you've done it a couple times, it's actually pretty easy to use. Uh, it's a little funky to learn, but it's pretty easy to use. And if you're a developer like me, you get there's some modules like the feed module that have traditionally been how you do imports that are uh, they're great except where they have limits. And once you're tired of those limits, it's almost as fast to rewrite that process uh, as a, a batch job. Once you know the pattern, you can write it just as fast as you can actually click through the interface and do it through feed. So I tend to drop back and do it in code uh, instead of doing it through that. Uh, the migrate process uh, is often the other answer people give the migrate module and that's way more complicated uh, and doesn't play nicely with that always. Uh, the other piece about all of batch is it's old. Batch was a brilliant solution when it arrived to this needing to reload Drupal and be able to progressively get a large job done. It was brilliant in Drupal 5. It is largely unchanged in the 12 years or more since it was invented, uh, which means the developer experience is a little bit wonky. And so that was some of the problem I was setting up to solve is this wacky uh, developer experience you have when doing it the old way uh, that's cooked in. Oh, that's what DX stands for? Developer experience. Developer experience. Yes. I thought that was Drupal, whatever. Drupal 5, Drupal 6, Drupal 7. I, I don't think it may be a Drupal. Uh, community shorthand, because if you go reading stuff on Drupal.org, you'll see lots of references to DX. So I picked it up. I don't know that anybody in any community anywhere else in the world uses that shorthand, uh, but it's very common in Drupal 6. Uh, 
Um, so just a quick overview of how you build a batch. Um, typically, you start a batch from a form, so you're uploading a file for import, uh, or you're specifying a certain number of, uh, you know, picking from a list uh, a bunch of nodes you want to update or users you want to delete, something of that nature. Uh, that form then submits back, uh, and it creates an array of tasks. And that's essentially what you see to the batch engine is this array of tasks that call a bunch of functions uh, in a very particular format, uh, which is formally known as the, the callback batch operation. Uh, if you look at the documentation, you'll see references to that. Something will implement the callback batch operation. Uh, and then at the end, when it's all done, it'll call a, a finish function, uh, which has a, the formal definition of the, the callback batch finish. Uh, basically, the batch operation is uh, you hand it the name of your function, an array of parameters that just get handed to the function, uh, you know, re-break them up as parameters, uh, and then it hands them this very particular array called context. And that context array is what gets used to maintain state over all these reloads. So you don't have to say it's to the database in between steps. Uh, it will keep, you, you just update that context array and it maintains it. And I'll show, when I get to the code sample, I'll show you what the, that context array looks like. So, like a reduced function in JavaScript where it passes back the, uh, the collection on each iteration. It, it's, it's a very similar concept. Uh, it's implemented creatively. Uh, or, it, or it's not creative. It, it was, again, it was one of the things when it was first came up with, it was a really great idea uh, that nobody else was doing. Uh, it's really old now. Uh, and other people have come up with better ways of doing things. Uh, but you can give it, any given task can be called once in that, list, in that list of operations, or you can feed it the same task a thousand times with different data. You can feed the same task a thousand times, same data. Uh, and I'm not going to get all the way out into the weeds, but even within a task, you can actually have, you can, within your function, you can tell that context array, I'm not done yet, call me again. Uh, and it'll actually keep recalling the same task over and over and over again uh, throughout the, the process. Uh, and you'll see, if you're reading other people's batch functions, you'll see that uh, as opposed to calling multiple functions. Uh, there's some data, re there's some uh, overhead reasons why you want to do that sometimes. Although it's pretty rare that you actually need to do that. Um, any given task run, you want to have it be short. You want your task to be very small because what happens is after each time the task function ends, Drupal checks how close it is to the timeout on PHP. If it's close, it reboots straps and fires off the next task. So it resets. Um, and if it's got a long time left, it'll just call the next task in the queue. Uh, so it'll keep working its way along until it, it runs through your whole queue. Uh, and then when all that's done, it's called batch finish, uh, which provides a status of whether or not things succeeded, uh, and a report, you know, another array of results, which is an element out of the out of the context array. So one of the elements that gets passed as a parameter. So you can again pass that pass of news to the final uh, display. Um, so why do we need a new interface? Technically, we do not need a new interface. Um, it works well enough. Uh, it drives the installer uh, batch operations. Again, you see it now and then. It works. Um, but it, we have all these new powers. As I was saying, forget it. there's all this new stuff uh, that we can do. Uh, the batch array that you have to build to define your batch, it's very specific and it's new. Kind of odd. It's built around procedural code in an object-oriented context. Uh, the current patterns either force you to use that, or you create a class with a bunch of static functions on it, uh, which never, if you're a developer who's used object-oriented, a class with a bunch of static stuff on it never feels quite right. Uh, classes are meant to be instantiated as objects, and then you get to use them. Um, and having a service that is more in keeping with the way the rest of Drupal works uh, means that your code, you can write code that's more in keeping with the rest of your project. So it's a more consistent code base. 
Uh, it also means that you can write a batch job as a service, and then you can have that task be something you can do just as a normal service. So it can be run in a batch mode, uh, or it can be run as a service. And this it, it come in useful for me a couple of times when I'm, again, in an import context. I can hand you the giant file, or I can just give you the fields for one, and just do this one thing as opposed to doing a thousand, or here's a, a CSV file with a thousand of them, go away and do it. But again, I've got all my code in one spot, instead of spread out and rewritten and, and duplicated. So it's all nicely packaged, and I can do it in keeping with Drupal 8 standards. Um, running batches, do you run that through the Drush, or is that a module that you expose and hit a button and like how? I'll show it in a couple of minutes, um, but again, it, it's typically done through the, your, the user experience is through the UI. The uh, admin UI. Uh, yeah, it's usually in the admin UI, although you're not limited to that, you can do it uh, on the, the front end UI. Uh, usually, front end themes don't theme it because it requires its own. It's its own piece of theme engine because it doesn't, when you see it, you'll notice the menus are all missing all your blocks and it's like it, it keeps itself lightweight. So you have theme it specifically, uh, which most people won't bother to do. Uh, but it actually can, it can run securely in the front of the path uh, if it needs to. And again, anytime you need it, you don't too often want anonymous people doing long running tasks. That's not a common thing you want to have happen. Uh, Although the way that works does protect you against some of the more, uh, some of the DDoS style attacks that long running operations would expose uh, because it is multiple bootstraps. So it is each one small. Uh, so the service I've created, uh, I've got it up in a sandbox project for folks who want to see it. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll look at the code a little bit towards the end. Uh, but you have it up and out. And I am using this on client projects now. Um, but I provide a programmatic interface uh, that defines a service as an abstract class, uh, and then it handles all those static functions. Like I have my abstract class defines all that static stuff you need uh, in that array, and in fact, I have a function in there that generates the batch definition. So I just hand it a list of operations, and it handles everything else. Uh, it just gives me back an array to hand to the batch engine and just say, go do this thing. Uh, and it, uh, abstracts away all of that complexity of making the batch engine happy. Uh, it just fires off and runs its jobs. Do you extend the service from something else? Uh, well then, so mine is all started from scratch. Um, but it then, uh, the, so I create this abstract class, and then when I go to implement it, I implement that abstract class, and there's uh, two or three methods I have to write to have my complete. Thing. And I actually define a formal interface that has more if somebody else ever wanted to do more uh, or replace it and do it a slightly different way. Um, and I can do that link back to you. Oh, okay, cool. And <laughs> so you take it out. Uh, so the form, uh, so again, any, when you're kicking out match jobs, typically you start with a form. So you either, you, usually you're creating a form or you're adding a submit handler. So this is the submit handler from a, the form we'll look at in a couple of minutes. Uh, and all it's doing here is the form has a value of message count. How many messages do I want to print? So this is a, it's going to be a, the example here you'll see is pretty basic. It's just going to be making a bunch of log messages. It's going to be something. Uh, so it prints a bunch of messages to the log. Uh, and so in the submit handler, I'm describing that how many did we ask for? Uh, and I'm telling it, the bat, my example batch service to generate my batch job. Here's the data from the form, and I set batch. If you normal, if you're used to seeing these submit handlers, there's often this giant array defined here, and a whole bunch of things to define your operations. Like usually, a bunch of crap uh, shoved in here to define this really weird bespoke array to run your thing. I got rid of all that, and I just handed my data, and I move on. So the first place, if I implement it, that I'm really doing work is in that generate batch job, which is I'm, I now have to know what that data array is supposed to be, because it's mine, it's specific to this job in this surface. Um, so, I have, so I know this message count, and I'm just putting in an operation into the list of operations, one for each log message. Uh, 
Uh, that log message there on the left with the array, that's going to be a function name in my service. Just going to call that function uh, and feed it the parameters on the left, on the right, rather. So, uh, log message will be called with an index uh, and a value. And that's again, that, that in this case, this is kind of a random thing, but that could be a node ID, that could be a user ID, that could be uh, field values, that could be anything you want in that array, and it's going to get fed as parameters to that function. And so we just define in our service that function. Um, and then it's got this internal class, a function that's in the uh, defined in my abstract class that's a prep batch array. And it handles all of the generation to make Drupal happy with that batch array. And the two uh, so the three parameters that are coming in are the message that is the title. We're going to put in the title across the top. That has changed since I wrote this slide. I fixed it because it was off one of the things I was working on. Uh, and then a message that is the initial, initialization message. It's what it says at the beginning while it's getting started. And then my list of operations. And again, in this context, I don't need to know what the heck the form of that array is. The rest of the array is handled by the class, and I don't have to remember exactly how you set it all up. Um, the other thing that is worth noting is that you'll see that I make references to this dash t. I put the translation system into the class. The logging system is also in the service. I'm injecting those into the service uh, through the service injection system that's built in to Drupal 8. So again, that's all just there. I have it more or less for free. I don't have to. Uh, Worry about those, they're just there. Uh, and if you lose these forms and control, there's a lot of like the T is built in a particular log array, is much less common, but I always like having a log. Uh, and so then I define our work method. This is the actual need of my task. Uh, again, in this particular context, it's a little bit random, because all I'm doing is generating a random message for the log. Um, <coughs> but again, I've got this dash logger is already defined. I didn't have to do it here. It was generated on the fly by the class uh, and it's just iterating through and doing it and you'll see that context array is now getting used to store the result so this is that context array as part of the batch system uh, and it's handing in the results key of that array stays throughout the life of your job so there's also a sandbox that stays within a task the task is, if the same task is called more than once It'll keep it sandbox. Um, the result is continuous over the whole life of the execution. Um, so that if I need to pass things across tasks, I pass them in results. If I need them within a task, I pass it uh, to sandbox. Uh, and so in this case, I'm just counting back out the message, uh, the number of messages that are generated to the log. Uh, and then we're done. We call the finish. And we go to the beach. Um, and again, this is that finish function. It's a, it's a Boolean for success, yes or no. Uh, everything that went into that context or, uh, results thing, you know, it's appearing in the results as an array of results. Uh, and now you can see the operation list if for some reason you want to process, it, to process it again or do something with it. So the results is the context once it's done. Right. It is this key out of context. So it's context results. Anything that's in that subarray becomes that result parameter here. Um, so everything kind of hopped over one so thing. So this context results message count becomes results message. Um, and again, some of these things I can't abstract away because they are integral to how batch, the batch system itself runs. Not necessarily a bad thing. So there is a little bit of funkiness to the flying monkey um, where I have to name my service because I don't know, I haven't figured out if there's a way from within a service to look up its own name. Um, normally you define the service for Drupal in another file. So I needed my class to actually know its own name because it needs to bootstrap itself. So one of the things that's happening is batch is calling all static functions under the hood here, and we'll look at this in just a minute. Uh, it's it just calls static functions. It can't call, it doesn't instantiate classes. So this service actually instantiates itself. It bootstraps itself, which means it has to know its own name to ask the Drupal container to provide the service. Um, and that's what then latches you in. 
And again, that's all stuff I abstracted out so that you have to look, know where it is. Um, right, so switching over. Let's see if this is actually working. So I just threw this into the config menu, but you've got the batch form. This form could live anywhere. Um, again, it could be public or private. Um, and it's just that it's that just asking for my message count. So we're going to give it a thousand, so it takes a minute, and we can actually see the progress bar. Um, and so we're going to see it come up. It'll have that initialization message in the title, uh, and then the progress bar will go across. So there is that initialization message, and now it's doing groups of those logging messages when it notices the timeout, reboot straps, and it'll log the thousand items. Um, if we go look at the log, we have these oh so useful log messages that have been recorded by the batch service. Um, just to prove that it was run. Right. Time of date stamp is 814 or 1840, so it's right now, right about now. These are the not my test ones from earlier that are down there somewhere. Um, but I just shoved them all in the batch system. Or into the log system. Uh, all right, so, oh, I gotta change what I'm sharing. Which? It's nice. I didn't know that Drupal allowed us to latch onto the batch system that they had. Yeah, and it's really convenient under certain conditions, uh, being able to get in there. Uh, particularly, again, if you're in an environment like Pantheon uh, or any of the platforms as a service platform, Pantheon, I mean, the, where you have very limited Drush access and you can't, like, often if you run your own server, you can just run a Drush script literally forever. It'll just crank and crank and crank and crank and crank and there's no timeout because you're on the command line. Awesome. But if you're in those uh, hosted platforms, they are time limiting those. Uh, again, to make sure that you're not sucking up on reasonable amounts of resources. I have a Blender project now where I've got a production site with 500,000 users. I need to remove all 500,000 users. There is no way to do that without running some kind of iterative job. And Batch is providing me that mechanism. Uh, for doing that that large operation. Um, I mean, it could be all sorts of things too. I mean, just updating a lot of content. I mean, whether it's a user specifically or, you know, if you need to update a whole bunch of nodes, you need to add a bunch of nodes for something, uh, you need to go update a bunch of nodes. I mean, there's lots of use cases where I think Batch would be incredibly useful. I'm already here, like, thinking of one already, like, where we have uh, forms that are... Uh, like a node, and this company has licenses in all the in every state except for like a handful. And if they get licensed in the new state, we'd have to update each form to show like okay now they're the at the state. And I think having this batch state would be a lot easier than telling the client to go update each one manually. Yeah, there's a, if there's a field that it can just add another value onto, then it can just. Uh, that can iterate, and you could kick that off from the node form. It is actually something you can kick off from the node. It's a little bit funky to kick it off from from node, but you could do it. You could add a, a submit handler to the node form and kick it from there if you needed to. What about media? So, specifically, that's what I'm talking about, the external media. I've never tried it, uh, but any form you can add a submit handler, and batch is meant to run from submit handlers. So you would add your own submit handler, all your submit handler, and away you go from there. Uh, so in theory, yes, not something I've actually done, but in theory, it's totally possible. So Aaron, I've got a question for you. Um, so I, I've, I've done a lot of this with Drupal 7, um, and I've done this for years, and it largely it hasn't cha I mean, it's changed um, as far as the implementation goes. Um, but some, I guess for a couple of examples of implementation uh, that I've used before, 
um, could be, you know, you might, you might have a certain page and you might, like you said, like a custom submission handler or, or a custom form. So like with Drupal, that would just be like, you know, using the form API to kind of generate a form on a, on a page that you've added with like a hook menu and, and that, you know, goes right. to a custom function. So like, but it's a little bit different now because I mean, it isn't like, um, well, I guess another example too, to kind of, to kind of reinforce this would be like, if you didn't, like maybe if you had um, a custom page before, like, so you might have something where you don't necessarily need a whole page. You just need to periodically process this function, you know, something that, you know, it could be a number of things that you're doing, but it's something that you're, you're doing frequently enough to where, you know, you would need to have ease, ease of access to that. So in some cases I've done things like reports, like generating reports and that would just be under the reports menu. Um, and all I would need to do is just go, you know, historically just go to hook menu, add a hook menu for, you know, report or admin slash reports slash whatever I want to call this. Um, and then I could have that go to a, a custom, um, callback, which then calls this, this function. Um, so like, I mean, that's one example. Um, and then next to the other one being on a custom form implementation. Uh, so as far as implementing that, like, would that be similar in Drupal 8? Um, as far as like, you know, if your routes and being able to add a custom route, um, or, or what would that look like? It's kind of the comparison. Does that make it, sense? It, it's similar. Uh, it, it is also different. Uh, I'll, we can, I can look, go through that. There's a the sub module here with the example in it, and I can walk through a little bit of how that form came into existence. Okay. Um, because it's got the it's got all those pieces the the replacement of menu the uh using the new form API implementation and whatnot um, and I can talk because I was going to talk already about kind of why it's a little different why my my solution works nicely in that compared to what you'd normally experience if you just did it the Drupal seven way on top of Drupal eight right uh, but yes yeah, so you can do that the other thing is if you want things to run on cron these days and you don't want to use hook cron um. If you, have, if you have a big job, and, and I've seen this done for report generation, uh, you can also define key workers that get created by the cron operation and then run when there's time. If, it, if it's not time sensitive, if you just need something periodically refreshed, you can generate key workers that will run whenever cron has the extra time to run. Um, and it'll just run till it's almost till it's almost at its time out and then stop till the next cron run. Um, but if you want to user experience, the user trigger to it, then batch is the way to go. Gotcha. And an example that you were just talking, that would be kind of like a sort of like Q API implementation of Drupal 7, but the, what you're referring to would be like the Drupal 8 version of that. Is that kind of what you're... Yeah, that is very different in, in 8 than it was in 7. Gotcha. The Q workers are very different in 8 than they were in 7. They're actually, they're a place, it's somewhat got me started with not liking batch being the same. Is the Q workers I really like a lot better. Right. Uh, because they are just a class. You just create a class that defines your queue worker and like it just takes over and handles scheduling it, and putting it on the queue and all of that. You don't have a hook over here doing one thing and a hook over there doing another thing and a hook over it just you create a class and people notices it and uses it. Nice. Uh, it's a much cleaner implementation. Uh, it sounds like it. It and then we got batches like it's the same. Really? You didn't make any improvements? Really? <laughs> And I'm not going to do it in any, but there's almost no difference. Uh, Very cool. So this is the interface I defined for my custom service. Uh, so it's got that helper to generate that batch array. Uh, and then the static function, and this gets called for every task. No matter what task you define in my implementation, it's going to call that run task static function. And what that does is it bootstraps the class and then calls the local do task. Uh, which then figures out which fun which actual local function I want to run. Uh, and this is part of what allows me to run this either as a service, like an actual service within Drupal, so I've got an instance of the class, or to run it in batch. So I, all these functions are repeated twice. These three statics are just there to be the interface to the batch system and kick off the processing in this class. And then these Second three are the ones that do the actual work. Uh, they're the ones that handle the interesting stuff. Um, so those last three functions could be private. They, you, they could have been defined as private. Um, I wanted them to be public because, again, I want to be able to use this as a service. 
So when we look at the example, we'll see why it's useful on particularly that first one on the, the generate batch job. I'll show you why that's useful. Uh, yeah, the next two absolutely could be at least protected. For, for PHP reasons, you can be protected, not private, but yeah, you don't need them to be fully public. Uh, I like them to be public because it does then let me leverage this fully as a service. Or, and I, all of its abilities are available as a service, not just uh, as a bespoke little abstract thing um, that, that makes that service happy. Um, so the actual abstract class here then, this does, handles all of the bits and pieces that I don't want to have to worry about every stinking time. Um, so it's where that the T function comes in. This is for me where I had the string translation trait. Uh, I define the logger. Uh, I create this protected static for the service name that I needed and that little funkiness. Um, this particular this construct pattern. This is part of the standard dependency injection. So when Drupal creates an instance of this, it's going to automatically hand in the parameters I need, and then I'm setting up the rest of the class from here. Uh, uh, but again, this generate batch, it just bootstraps the class uh, and then recalls the local version of it. Uh, same with the run. Uh, I'm surprised this version's working. That's not. I have a bug in do, do, do task doesn't need to be written this way. It can just be written uh, a little more simply as this task name. But I'll fix that later. Uh, first time you show up your code, something you always know something. Um, and then again, the, the finished batch is that same, that same pattern. Um, but this is why I needed that name, because I need to know I need to tell Drupal to give me one of these. This is that bootstrap process. And again, this is where I get string translation trade, I get a logger, I can have any service I want out of Drupal just from this one line. You could, as long as your service is defined, it'll just go get it. Uh, and that's, that's why this is so nice and so magic. If it, I don't have to do anything else, Drupal will find me all the assets I need for my service just by asking it for it. Um, and again, this is all that crap that I don't want to have to deal with. So the prep batch array, this thing's funky. Like, batch arrays are just funky things. Um, I have to define my list of operations. Uh, I have to give it, uh, yeah, they are a title, an init message, operations, finish, my operations array has to be in a very particular format. All of these things are static. There's nothing about this process I like. So I wanted to put it all in one function and never have to worry about it again. And there it is. So it's in its own little place. I don't have to remember whether that's init underscore message, init message, init message, camel case, like, I don't care. Ops, operation, I don't care. Uh, there are a couple of the parameters you could be setting that I don't need to use because I'm using a class. Because um, you can t usually tell it if you're using procedural code and you've got it in a particular include file, you can point it to the include file, it's a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't need any of it, I don't want to have to remember, I don't like thinking about it, it's annoying. So I hide it. Uh, and that's all this little class does. So this again, it's just, it's just here to remove the annoying bits and uh, provide me that those helpers in the service that I always want. All right. Uh, so then implementing it. So I've got the example module in here just to make it sane for somebody else who's not me, or me in a month and a half uh, to remember how this is all set up. So if you're new to eight, uh, when you define a service, the very first thing you do is you create this YAML file. Uh, it's just serve it, your module name dot services dot YAML, and you're defining all the services you want in your file, in your uh, that you're creating that you're implementing. Um, and then it's, you know, it's the header there and then the name of your service. Uh, the class is the namespace of the class that implements it for you. And then the argument, again, you see that logger and that string translation trait, those are the subservices that your service is leveraging. So this is dependency injection uh, and service injection, or what are the concepts here that are, this is 
what they actually look like in practice. And this is where the magic of services from Drupal play out is I'm getting a, a logger factory and the whole translation system provided to me in a YAML file and as parameters in that construction, in that, in that constructor. And I don't have to know where, they, where, where the class is. If somebody overwrote it in this particular instance and created a more advanced translation system that somebody has plugged in, I don't care. It's going to get handed to me, and it's just going to magically work. The logging system, I'm, you know, I've asked it for the standard logger. If somebody has upgraded and replaced the standard logger with a better logger, I don't care. If their logger is tied to the file to system logging instead of database logging, not my problem. All of that is just packaged up in there. Magically happened. I didn't have to think about it. it just worked. Um, and you can have you'll see some classes like some services where people inject just huge number of service other services. If you're doing you're interacting with other websites, you'll want guzzle for the HTTP client. Um, you know, there's just a mountain of services in D8 that just do stuff for you and you don't have to re-implement. You're um, passing in the translation service to the... That's what string translation is. It's the translation service. Um, and that's what gives me that this T. So I've got the translation function and how I have it nicely injected into my service. Uh, and I'm working and playing well with the, inject with the translation system. Uh, to Will's earlier question. Um, so the next thing, the, the other piece of this that's in here is I've got this form. Uh, so when you create, you, almost any time I create a form in Drupal 8, I use Drupal console to generate it. I don't write this by hand. Not that you can't, not at all hard, but I don't. Uh, because why would I want to remember this? Uh, but the form, Like it'll, like the Drupal, uh, the console model generator will generate your form class and all the functions that it needs to be a full implementation. And again, we're back around to service injection. Here's my batch service getting injected. Uh, and again, I didn't actually have to write this. The generator wrote this for me. Um, but this is service injection. It is pushing my service into this form. So it's available for me to use as an object in this form. Uh, and you know, right, so my service has two services inside it, but here I'm only asking for one. So Drupal knows that batch example, example batch, needs logger and string translation. And so they, are get, they get injected into that, and then the example batch gets injected into here. And again, I didn't have to think about all of those things all at once, each one happens in its own context, and I don't have to remember. Uh, uh, when you generate things from the console, it'll generate your uh, form array. If you're new to Drupal form APIs, or uh, this is how you gen just find a form in Drupal 8. It's very similar to forms in Drupal 7. Uh, for those who have done this a lot in Drupal 7, uh, the form API has changed a little bit exactly what uh, field types are available in what ways is a little bit different. Uh, but this is this is that form that we saw this, you know at the very beginning when I first kicked it off. That's how it's defined. Um, <coughs> okay, I don't actually I'm not showing it this one, so I won't switch over to it. Um, but again, that whole, the form is very simple. Uh, and in this context, form, this is some why I went ahead and injected the string translation straight into my service. Forms always have it. Part of the parent class is to always have the translation trait available. It's kind of nice. Um, the new form API, the class has been defined, validate, and submit handlers. They used to be things you defined elsewhere. Uh, they are now hooked into your form class. Um, and as I showed at the beginning, you know, there's that submit form function that kicks off the batch job. Um, and this is where it's nice to have my service injected into this service. And why I make that generate batch process a public function is I've got this as an object here and not calling it statically. Uh, 
Uh, and so I'm able to interact with this as a proper object, not as a static function on the class. Um, it's a little bit purist of me to, to do that. I like it. It's a convenience. If I had a <coughs> service in more than just run a batch, I would have access to all of what it does. Um, I could log a random message from here, right here, if I wanted to. If I wanted to log a message before the batch kicked off, I could do it here. It's a random example, so it doesn't really need to be all that useful. <laughs> and then to Will, the other half of Will's question, when you generate these, you get the routing file and the link file. These are the replacement Will to hook menu. Um, so you create both a route, which is the definition of the path and what Drupal should do with it. It's actually what Symfony should do with it. This is out of Symfony 4, pretty close to, uh, it's, it's altered a little bit, but not a lot from Symfony Core. Um, so I've defined path, uh, and then where where do you find the code for the thing access path? Um, and if you had more nuanced, if you had security on it, there was some kind of permission requirement, it would be here uh, under requirements. Obviously, in this case, I just made it public because it's a stupid example. Um, it doesn't need to have it. restrictions on it. You could place restrictions under here, either permission or other access controls. And then to get it on the menu system, to actually place it on the main Drupal menu, uh, you put a, a links.menu YAML file, and that defines the menu allocation. So when it was when I showed it earlier, it was actually on the menu under config. This is the piece of code that does that. And again, I'm not having to worry about the rest of that menu. I don't know anything about the rest of that menu. I don't know what its array structures are, uh, any of that. I just needed to know the name of the parent that I wanted to drop it on. Oops, not that one. What if you wanted to control the order in which it comes in? You can put wait. Okay. The Drupal wait system is here. Um, so you can do it. It, it sorts alphabetically by default, and then you can put a, a wait and a, a number in the middle. I think most of the basic course stuff is at zero, and so if you go to negative, if you want to be above it, you go to negative, and if you want to be below it. It can be a little bit tricky to sort within because of that, but uh, it works. It does a decent job of it. But yeah, you can you can do that. Most people don't bother to sort the menus by that way. Particularly under config. <coughs> people are, uh, there's a fairly good usability argument to be made on Drupal for you to do things off better. Um, because otherwise there's the menus because somebody else's module could be adding their own stuff too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little hard to figure out who, who wins. Uh, but yeah, you can reorder it if you need to. Uh, you can also reorder it in the UI later, and that'll override whatever's in here in terms of the, the order. Okay, and then we got the actual implementation of my class. So I've got this little funkiness where I have its name for the bootstrap process. Um, that magically disappears and goes off and does its own thing. Uh, I have my generate job. This, is, this function is required to make the class work. It's not to find anywhere else. So I have to find it here, the class won't run, because it's, an ad, it's extending an abstract class. Uh, and so again, I just create my batch array. I just create my batch operations, not the full array, just the batch operations, and then I send it off for prep. And again, I don't have to remember that prep array, because I took care of that also. Um, you can have multiple batch functions, batch services within this model. I could have, uh, I. Since you define the class, you can add. Then we, it would be a little bit uh, picky about language. I can have as many functions in here. I just want to call it my function name. So right here, I've got log message is my key to this operation. Um, and then log message is the function it's going to call. I can have as many of those as functions on this class as I want. If I want those calling additional services, absolutely. I could be injecting another service. I could be injecting Guzzle, which is the HTTP client. And then I would have, I could be doing something over HTTP to, you know, if I was pulling in uh, an asset from another place, if I was loading in a thousand files from another service and making them all uh, media entities within this one. Each one could be doing stuff that required, you know, calling Guzzle, asking Guzzle for the file, uh, and then creating the, the media entity after that. 
uh, and so that so yes, I can do both the the having as many and then and to do my ops array, I would just make as many references to my local function as I wanted. You technically this could be any step any global or static. No, it's not anymore. It has to be a, in this implementation. It has to be a method on this class uh, because I loop around to that those do tasks methods that I wrote. They have to be able to have a, a function name that matches that. Key. So it has to be a local key. That's the way it was set up. And then, right, that's the choice I made. Um, I could make a complicated security argument for it, but that's garbage. I just wanted it simple. Um, and again, I can call out here. I could, I'm not limited to what's here. Uh, and in fact, I was tired of having a giant, even writing this little trivial example, I didn't like log message having a giant array of messages in it. So this service could be presenting me with random useless quotes from many URLs in Drupal if I wanted it. It doesn't have to be doing it as a batch to the logger. It could give me a random message to print out at the top of the, the form. You can actually probably, but is this a possibility of going and looking through all the existing nodes and printing out or logging each title? Uh, that is a, a more classic older uh, batch example module did exactly that. Oh. Uh, there was a somebody's example module in some version that yeah loaded every node and saved and logged its its title. Uh, absolutely, you could do that. I thought about doing that, but that doesn't necessarily work in an example type. So you have to stop and create those. <laughs> Whereas this one just it's all nicely self contained. But yeah, you could have it log every username, you could have it log every uh, node name, whatever you want. Uh, anything iterative over large data sets makes sense to do potentially makes sense to do a batch. Um, let's switch back real quick to the slide deck. One or two other things and then Uh, so there are some related core efforts. There are some movements finally in the last year or so to actually do some better stuff in core around batch and make it a true service. Uh, they are, I think, a ways from being done. I think when they are done, they will be better than what I have done because they'll be part of core. Um, but I actually honestly just noticed these the other day. Uh, but they're, they're very old tech issues with movement only very recently. So I'm I'm looking forward to these, but I think they're a way off from being actually completed. Um, 